Good afternoon and welcome to our first Virginia Hospital Center Foundation Medical Leadership Huddle of 2021. I'm Tony Burchard, president of the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation and it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. It's great to have the opportunity to share the latest information about the hospital's ongoing response to COVID-19. So to ensure the best view and quality, participants have been muted. We'll have a Q&A following the presentation and feel free to send your questions via the Zoom chat function or you can email them to foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. We don't have a chance to answer your questions uh, during our allotted time this afternoon. We'll try to follow up afterwards via email. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, our new chief medical officer, Dr. David Lee, who just also happens to be our hometown doc. Dr. Lee joined the hospital's executive leadership team late last year. And uh, prior to that, he was uh, anesthesiologist um, that served here at Virginia Hospital Center for 30 years. Um, most recently as the operating room medical director at Dominion Anesthesia since 2007, and he was elected to the president of the VHC medical staff in 2018. Dr. Lee continues to serve on both the VHC system and VHC foundation boards. And finally, last but not least, um, as I kind of mentioned, he's our hometown guy. Uh, Dr. Lee grew up in Arlington and he's a proud alumnus of Wakefield High School. So Dr. Lee, let me offer you uh, thank you to get started for joining us today. Dr. Lee, over to you. All right, thank you, Tony. Um, really excited to be here, joined with our community partners at VHC. Um, let me give you the state of the union right now here at VHC. I'm looking at my dashboards. Here at the hospital, we currently have 79 patients in-house with positive COVID. Um, four people that are ruling out for COVID. And then we have a total of eight in the ICU, five of which are intubated on the ventilator. So we're sort of near the high water mark that we've been. Uh, back in the summer, we probably hit about 115, 120 patients in house. So we're slightly down from that. Uh, the good news is the positivity trend has come down to about 6.7% for the last seven days. And really, if you look at the past month or so, we've been above 10%, it's close to, to 15%. So great news on that. I'm hoping that this is not a blip, but a trend of COVID going down. Now uh, let's get to some vaccination news. I know everyone's very interested in vaccinations. So uh, when Pfizer, came out with their vaccine and it got its EUA, the emergency use authorization, Virginia Hospital Center through the state of Virginia got access to the drug very quickly. So we opened up our clinic. We were able to vaccinate uh, all the VHC employees, medical staff and their employees very quickly. Um, we also partnered with uh, Arlington Public Health. We went to the free clinic vaccinated the vulnerable population there. And then at the Walter Reed Community Center in conjunction with public health, we were able to open up to uh, uh, Arlington and nearby residents 75 and older. And then uh, as the governor uh, encouraged us to move 65 and over. So we've been able to vaccinate probably 16,000, perhaps close to 20,000 doses of vaccine here. Uh, and then there's been a change, right? So the last few days, we were given notice that the allocation from the federal government to Virginia was gonna be cut. And the allocation from Virginia to the hospitals would no longer be available. All the available doses would go to public health districts. So now I think our allocation is about 2,500 doses that will go to Arlington Public Health and uh, they will take over the vaccination of those patients who are in the 1B and the near 1C category. 
Um, that sort of takes us out of the vaccine business, we're sad to say. Uh, anyone who has gotten their first dose through Virginia Hospital Center will be guaranteed of getting their second dose by us. But after that, we will be depleted of vaccine and we'll be working in conjunction with Arlington Public Health. Dr. Lee, let me, um, let me ask you just to uh, drill down a little bit on that situation, because um, even though it's been in the media, I just want to make sure that uh, our stakeholders that are participating this afternoon are really clear on this situation around quantity, uh, the supply. And um, so, as you suggested, uh, you know, the, the, the doses, the vaccines are made available from the federal government and it goes to the state. And then what's happened is not all in part because there are fewer doses in total, but there's a new formula, right? That the state um, in, in deciding which health districts get what quantity, it's based on your population. Is that correct? Right. So essentially the health districts will get the amount of vaccine that's proportional to the population of that district. So Arlington is perhaps uh, around 2%, uh, they'll get their portion of vaccine, which will come out to about 2,500 doses. Yeah, so the, the rub has been, you know, and this is really where there's a lot of friction and it's, you know, unfortunately it's out of the hands of us here at Virginia Hospital Center because we, as you mentioned, we made a commitment not only to the community, we went to the Arlington Free Clinic first, as you suggested, our first vaccines, Dr. Lee, you and I were down there yep. uh, just a couple of Mondays ago before we vaccinated any of our patients, uh, right after we vaccinated our frontline healthcare workers, we, we went down to the Arlington Free Clinic and vaccinated those folks down there. And then we made a commitment to the county to administer the Walter Reed Community Center down on 16th Street South um, and beautiful operation down there, very high marks from those that received vaccines. And then we also in tandem, we're taking care of uh, Virginia Hospital Center physician group patients down in Shirlington. And so um, the reason I kind of walk through all that is that we don't ask our patients, members of the Virginia Hospital Center physician group, we don't ask them where they live. So we have patients from all over the metropolitan area, all over Virginia. We have patients from the district, we have patients from Maryland. And if they're a patient of Virginia Hospital Center, they met the criteria of being 75 or older, we vaccinate them because of our commitment to our patients. And that unfortunately is not uh, what is being mandated by, by Arlington County. They are being very rigid about the fact that the doses that come into Arlington County through the health department are only gonna be administered to Arlington County residents. Is that correct? Right. I mean, it is a bit frustrating because we serve a larger population than just Arlington County. Now, in fact, when we drilled down through the numbers, 90% of the folks that were vaccinated by us at Walter Reed was Virginia residents. And a good portion of that, 70% or more, were Arlington residents. But remember, we vaccinate all our medical staff, all our employees, all our patients, and many of them may work here, but may live in Fairfax County or Alexandria County as well. That's right. So good. I, I just I just thought it was important for us to drill down a little bit because there's been a lot of questions coming in over this past weekend and right up until the time of our uh, time of getting on this Zoom call, uh, people trying to understand, you know, what changed and what role did Virginia Hospital Center have? And, and ultimately, Virginia Hospital Center had no role. We are just doing what we're told. And ultimately, we only have vaccines for, for the folks that got the first dose, right? They'll be able to get their second dose. Correct. And remember, these vaccines are owned by the federal government. They purchase these vaccines, they distribute them out to the states, and then the states distribute the vaccine as they think is gonna best serve their population. So up to this point, the hospitals received the allocation because many of the hospitals had the storage capability to store the vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine needs a minus 70 degree freezer and we had that. But now uh, it's been decided that it's going to go to the public health uh, districts themselves directly. So, you know, for these folks, I know they're frustrated. We had we had to cancel a bunch of folks that um, had appointments with us. And uh, and, you know, my understanding is Arlington County Health Department is going to try to reach out back to those people 
and they're going to try to make sure that people don't lose their place in line and the best that they can, best their ability. So really, what should people do? If they had an appointment, um, what should they do? So we've had to uh, cancel our appointments. And remember, we did this because we had to. We just don't have the doses. We're not being given the doses. So since it's being uh, administered by the health districts, uh, wherever you live, whether it's Arlington, Fairfax, Alexandria, Prince William, you need to keep in touch with the health districts. Uh, they will apprise you of when and where to go for your vaccinations. Absolutely. And then um, do we have any more uh, clarity around uh, at this time? I, I, I know because you're on these calls multiple times a day. So you get things sometimes in real time. And, and I know you're very good at sharing it. But, you know, what we haven't talked about is the role of our retail pharmacists, um, because, you know, ultimately, even before the vaccines get out of phase three trials, there was a lot of discussion that uh, from a logistics perspective, a big uh, medical supply logistics company like McKesson um, would be involved in that CVS pharmacies and Walgreens pharmacies and some of the other, you know, the targets and the, the big grocers um, that they at Walmarts and such that they would be providing vaccines because, you know, many people are used to going to those uh, locations to get their annual influenza vaccine. And uh, I heard Dr. Scott Gottlieb saying that last year, 29, uh, 2020, was a record year for, for vaccinations for influenza. We had 120 million uh, vaccinations that were administered, uh, all-time records, we've been keeping records. And most of that was done through those type of uh, establishments. So, you know, what, 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 what are we hearing around the role of those uh, big retailers? Well, sure. So the original plan was a three-pronged approach. You had hospitals vaccinating healthcare workers. You had public health uh, vaccinating uh, emergency workers, frontline uh, individuals. And then you've had the commercial sector with Walgreens, CVS, going into the nursing homes and uh, assisted living facilities to take care of those populations. So that was the original intent. Uh, it's kind of worked better in some places than others. I know in West Virginia, they've actually uh, gone to the more local pharmacy route and they've been actually able to uh, vaccinate quite a lot of their population already. So more to come on that. So I, my, 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 I suspect that we'll have a similar situation in Virginia at some point, uh, the, those folks playing a bigger role. We, we do, um, uh, we, we want to go down, um, uh, continue to talk about vaccines, but we did have a timely question I do that came in the chat that, that, that uh, we need to address right now. So we, um, we had a question, what is a health district? So can you explain to our participants, what is a health district within the Commonwealth of Virginia? Uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a public health district, for instance, your county. Arlington County is his own individual health district. So it's apportioned uh, by locality. So, so I live in the city of Alexandria, or um, I, my, my health district would be the city of Alexandria. For folks that live here in Arlington County, their district is Arlington County Health Department. For the people that live in Falls Church, uh, a lot of our patients that live in Falls Church and uh, Annandale, um, uh, they would go to Fairfax County. That would be their health district, right? That's exactly right. Okay, good. So, and then really the best way for them to stay up to speed would be, um, would be then to be watching um, their email. And in fact, you can go into your health district website. So uh, like I'll, I'll, I'm, I get updates from Arlington County, Arlington County Health Department. I signed up to get emails from them. So Arlington County sends out timely emails to get me up to speed about what's going on with the vaccine program. Uh, likewise, I, I do the same with the city of Alexandria. So it's where you live, that's your district. You would go to the website and you would, uh, the, health, the uh, health department within your municipality that you live, so if you live in Fairfax County, you would go to the Fairfax County Health Department. You could Google just Fairfax County Health Department. And then when you get to the homepage, there should be a link to click on that then takes you to the COVID-19 information. And there should be a place there that you can request to get email updates. So um, I, I recommend people to 
be watching their email, but also don't hesitate to continually go back to your website of your health district to get the latest news because they are updated uh, throughout the day as information becomes uh, available again. Everybody's got to remember this is coming from the federal government through the Commonwealth of Virginia down to your municipal, your local municipality. So it's that's the, the line of the communication. Unfortunately, you know, Virginia Hospital Center and the other health systems and hospitals in the region, we're really uh, we're really out of it. We're really not part of the vaccine uh, uh, solution, which is unfortunate, as Dr. Lee said. And but we think it's important for our patients to be up to speed. And along that line, Dr. Lee, there is some questions around uh, the different types of COVID vaccines that have been approved. Right now, there's two that uh, we have we have experience administering and that are continuing to be administered uh, here in Virginia. And that's the Pfizer uh, vaccine and then the Moderna vaccine. Um, can you share a little bit around the characteristics of those vaccines, maybe the efficacy, expected efficacy that we learned through the clinical trial process and anything that um, our stakeholders should know um, uh, prior to them getting the vaccine, in, uh, regardless of which one they receive? The, uh, there's been some vaccine hesitancy with some of these early vaccines. Pfizer, Moderna, it took them less than a year to bring out these uh, mRNA vaccines. And that's really a world record, right? Typically, it would have taken four years, five years, 10 years to make a vaccine, but it's a whole new technology. The computing power is a lot better, the data's better. The minute we found out about this pandemic, the gene for this virus, the gene sequencing was done. So you could take that blueprint and manufacture these vaccines very quickly. Now, some of it is trial and error, right? Uh, these mRNA vaccines, you, you gotta see what works and what doesn't work. Luckily, Pfizer came out with the a recipe that worked very quickly. Uh, Moderna came out very quickly. They both got emergency use authorization. Now these are very fragile uh, molecules. They're enveloped in sort of a lipid coating and that's why they need the special handling and the, and the frozen temperatures to, to keep the integrity of that molecule intact. Now you've got the other vaccines and I'm excited about Johnson & Johnson vaccine coming out. That's actually in the third uh, clinical phase trial three, uh, when that comes out, that doesn't have any special handling requirements. And unlike the other vaccines so far, it's one dose. So you can go out to all these places without refrigeration, inoculate somebody with one dose, bam, you're done. You don't have to keep track of folks like we do now that require two doses and special handling. Uh, the, the main fact right now is we don't have enough vaccine. Now, President Biden has set out an ambitious program to vaccinate first uh, a million folks a day, so 100 million in 100 days. And recently he revised that up to one and a half million uh, doses per day to get to 150 million. Guess what? If you do the math, you need to be twice that level. We need 200 million doses in the first 100 days. That gets us to the point where we could think about herd immunity this summer and not go into the fall season with this virus still hanging over us. That's uh, that's a, a incredibly um, um, heartening, to be honest, that uh, we, we see light at the end of the tunnel. Janice just sent in a question um, on the chat, uh, Dr. Lee. Um, people that are scheduled for their second shot, um, they, she was just wanting confirmation, they go back to the same location where they got their first shot. Is that correct? Yes, the, if you received your first shot through VHC or one of the VHC partnerships, we have your second dose and we will give it to you. So you'll get notice for that. And it's, uh, the rule is where you got it is where you're gonna get. And that's the, and that's the thing that you said with the J&J, &J, when, that, when that gets approved for emergency authorization, um, one dose done. So that's gonna make it much easier and should happen much more quickly. So. Um, realistically, uh, 100 million doses in 100 days from, from where you sit now, Dr. Lee, um, is, that a, is, that, is that just um, aspirational or, or, or is there, is there a, an opportunity we can, get, we can reach that milestone? I think it's somewhat aspirational, but I think it's achievable. 
And remember, we're, we're in a pandemic. We can't take nights and weekends off. We need to go 24 seven and vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. That's the only way, If here again, if you do the math, there's 320, 350 million people in this country. We must do 2 million a day in order to achieve herd immunity by the end of the summer. That's where we need to be. And remember, there's nothing magical about this country alone, right? If only this country is vaccinated, guess what? Every time somebody flies in, every time we go abroad, we take a chance on bringing that back here. So our goal is not only to vaccinate the United States, but also the entire world so that we eradicate this virus. Yeah, so another good question that just popped up in the chat is, you know, but what will the vaccines be there to accomplish these goals? And I just know uh, in the reading I did over the weekend, try to get up to speed prior to our huddle today, that um, that J and J is forecasting that they will be able to produce a billion. That's with a B, a billion doses to be administered this calendar year. And uh, so that's just J and J. Um, again, uh, based without getting too too wonky, it's based on the way this vaccine is produced by J and J, which is different than the way it's produced by Pfizer and Moderna. That's part of while they're able to produce it more quickly. And then secondly, because the J&J vaccine doesn't have to be kept at such a severe cold temperature as you'd already described why the others need to be, um, having a billion doses of the J&J vaccine being that it's a single dose vaccine means that that's, that's a billion people, a billion doses for a billion people. So, so um, if that's the case just with J&J alone, uh, would, you, would you agree that, that um, once we get over this short term uh, hurdle of uh, some shortages right now uh, that ultimately um, in 2021, there should be enough vaccine for anybody who wants it? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I have a lot of faith in these companies to ramp up production very quickly. And remember that the president is summoning the War Powers Act to ensure that they put the resources behind that effort. And, and remember, it's not just the vaccine. You need manpower and just simple things like the syringes and the needles. Right now, there's, there's apparently a little shortage on the type of needle that's used to vaccinate. So all those little elements need to come together. But can we do it? Absolutely. We live in a world where on a click of a mouse button at Amazon.com, you can order anything you want and it gets delivered to your home. So I have no doubt that the production capabilities of these companies with the help of the federal and state governments will achieve that, that goal. Excellent. So um, we're, we're getting some questions, you know, and again, a lot of this is following the uh, kind of the directions of our national media and local media. And now over the last uh, week or so, a lot of discussion over variants to the original coronavirus, which just for the record, I, I am not a medical doctor. Uh, I, did, I do play one on TV on occasion, but so uh, I don't want to get outside of my my lane, Dr. Lee. But but my understanding of, of viruses is that they they tend to the, the variant is, is is what they do. Viruses constantly are changing, right? So that the fact that these viruses are there's variants to this virus is not unusual. Is that correct? Viruses are very uncanny. Now that's another reason why there's an imperative to to conquer this quickly because the longer you let this virus out there, the, the more chances that it's gonna mutate. Already, you've got the Brazilian mutation, you've got the South African mutation, you've got the British mutation. And I have to tell you, just yesterday, I was informed that the British invasion has occurred here in Virginia. Uh, we discovered the first uh, British variant here in the Commonwealth in Northern Virginia uh, and that press release went out just yesterday. So it's real. And that's another reason why we need to be efficient and conquer early. Now, by all measures, the vaccines have proven effective against all the known variants to date. But uh, the longer we let this go, the more likely that uh, it may be able to penetrate those defenses. Yeah, and and um, there was another question that came in early and, um, and it was around, you know, testing for variants, and that you know, uh, it, some of the countries 
especially in Europe, uh, tend to do a better, have been doing a better job. And, and, um, and so at the end of the day, um, you know, what companies like Illumina that, that sequence, uh, sequence uh, genomic material um, are taking a look at these variants and they're sequencing these variants to, to uh, sequencing the virus to, to, to better determine what makes up these variants. Um, there's, you know, some of these countries are doing up to 70% of all cases. And of course, in a smaller country like, say, Denmark, um, you know, that the, 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 um, the pool is, is, is manageable compared to a country like the United States, you know, so it's not really apples to oranges. But um, do you, have, you, uh, have you been hearing of a bigger emphasis on the, you know, the upstream testing around these variants um, so we can better understand how to combat these variants, whether it, it's going to mean a you know, boost to the current uh, uh, vaccines or do we need to change the vaccine formula to deal with the variant? So that's, you know, the, the question, I guess, is are we going to do more of testing of variants so that we better are prepared? So the testing of the variants is very sophisticated and it's going on all the time. We validate our uh, testing here at the hospital. The scientists, the manufacturers are always looking out for that variant and testing. Now, here's a take home message though. No matter what variant you're dealing with, the treatment, the vaccination scheme is still the same. So the game plan for us is to continually check and recheck, make sure that we're covering all the variants. But at the same time, it does not change our therapy or the inoculation plan. So we're moving forward with that as fast as we can. That's great. We're, we're bumping up against um, our 30 minute time line, but um, we kind of started this with uh, Dr. Rohit Modak um, and in um, and, and reminding everybody of the Modak rules. So in honor of uh, Dr. Modak, Dr. Lee, would you like to remind um, everybody of the Modak rules before we sign out? So, Luckily, a guy named Dr. Modak went into infectious disease and there are rules named after his name. Because if Lee went into infectious disease, it'd only be L-E-E, -E, not enough letters to cover all these facts. So the Modak rules is M, mask, wear a mask. O stands for outdoors. D is distance, keep at least six feet or more away. Uh, a is for avoid, avoid crowds and avoid situations. And K for know the rules. Now you want to uh, know, educate yourself so you don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to keep yourself vulnerable. So That's those great. are simple rules. Modax rules, live by them. Even without the vaccine, we could cure this. Now remember, even without the vaccine, if we truly lock down all war masks and follow those rules, 30 days, this disease would end. And we know about this because other countries have done this. COVID does not exist in, uh, in New Zealand. COVID in China, where it all started, they pretty much conquered this disease because when they lock down, they bring the army in and don't let planes, trains, automobiles travel back and forth. So we have the know-how, we have the technology, and now we have the vaccines. We're gonna beat this, it's a matter of time. We just have to do it in an expeditious manner. Well, thank you, Dr. Lee. That's um, that's some good words to and advice to follow. With Modak rules, as well as providing us examples of countries that have beaten it, beat this disease. So, I want to thank you for our briefing today. I want to thank all our stakeholders for joining us. You know, this will be posted in the next few days um, onto the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation um, webpage. So, uh, if you want to encourage your other friends to uh, get this, I think Dr. Lee provided some. Uh, fantastic and very timely information uh, that everybody can benefit from. So we're very grateful. And um, and if your question did get answered or you have additional questions, don't hesitate to email those to us. So in the meantime, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks much. Bye-bye.